Good evening. Welcome. We're so pleased to have you on this beautiful evening to talk about revolutionizing work through compassion. Uh, my name is Monica Warline, and I'm the Acting Associate Director of Stanford Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. And one of the most joyful parts of the work that I get to do with CARE, um, if you don't know the organization, that's the way we cut down that long name into something manageable. Uh, one of the most joyful parts of what I get to do is to welcome visiting scholars from all over the world and show them around the Stanford campus and introduce them to the wonderful um, network of researchers who are talking and thinking about compassion. And I'm especially joyful today because this is a reciprocal visit. I had the honor to be invited to go to Helsinki in January and um, be with this wonderful team of researchers that you're going to meet tonight talking about compassion and work. And in exchange, they turned right around and said, we want to come to California. <laughs> and I said, what a great idea. We would love to have you. So uh, I want to introduce Anna Brigitta Pessi, who's going to be the team lead. And she has a fabulous team of young researchers working with her. Um, they are doing really interesting exploratory work in multiple domains, and I think that you will find that the energy that they're bringing to the study of compassion and work is really infectious. And I want to say hello to everyone in Australian public broadcasting, because you may not know it, but all of Australian public broadcasting is going to hear, um, delayed, our <laughs> session tonight. And it's one of the first times that we've had um, a national broadcasting service request to air one of our lectures. So you can really see that Anna Vergita and her team, um, she is herself an award-winning researcher. And now that she has turned her sights to compassion, um, she is um, firing up Finland. <laughs> and now that she's here in California, I look forward to the fire spreading here too. So please welcome Anna Vergita Pessi. Thank you, Monica, and hello, everybody. I feel so very happy to be standing here and such deep gratitude to be here with this wonderful group of people. And um, indeed, thank you so very much for this most inspiring invitation. It's such a sacred moment for a researcher to step into the Stanford campus. So really, really happy. So my name is Anna Birgit, and here we have Anna and Frank, and Mia, and Dee. Oh, hi, Mia. And I will introduce them in, in more detail a little bit later. And what we would like to do today is to share with you our thoughts and our work on individually together in compassion and co-passions. And we would also like to share with you some chocolate from Finland straight from Finland to you. And thanks to Tee, they are, they are here and she will <laughs> spread the joy. <laughs> Thank you, Tee. So our team really is a multidisciplinary group of, of people, including fields of theology, social psychology, pedagogy, social, social psychology, uh, sociology, and business studies. And the team as Monica pointed out, is a group of amazingly talented young researchers. And, and also they have such deep sense of solidarity among them that I'm just grateful to be working with the group. And please do check our website, our Co-Passion website, that you can see and you can find there the full description of our team. It's altogether 12 researchers and they are just such wonderful, wonderful individuals. I'm a scholar of sociology of religion and sociology of welfare, and most of my previous work has been on issues such as altruism, good life, happiness, care, and volunteering. And methodology-wise, most, uh, most of our team's work is related to empirical methods conducted both by qualitative and quantitative as well as multi-methods approach. 
So what we bring to the table of compassion research is first empirical analysis and combination of conceptual and empirical analysis and, the, and second blend of societal, meso and individual level analysis. And today we will start sort of more on the general conceptual lines and then move forward to the concrete arena of working life. And let us start with a question. Please take a moment of pondering in silence, you with yourself, this question. When did you experience a sense of meaning? It is so beautiful to see that quite many of you start to gently smile in, in thinking about these precious thoughts. And many of you surely thought of something related to your personal perspective, authentic you, fulfilling yourself, but not most likely in solitude. I bet most of your thoughts were, uh, were fundamentally about the relational perspective, you with other people, you for other people. We really cannot separate these two angles from each other, fulfilling oneself and with others for others. That is the basis and the, the crown for human happiness and human sense of meaning. And this synergy is what I call individually together. Not individually and together, but individually together, inseparably. And compassion, our topic today, it is also sometimes used too much to sort of emphasize the provider perspective, even though it is deeply relational phenomenon. And it is about shared sense making, just as Monica so beautifully describes in her work. And let me share with you a story. It is a story of individuality, individuality together. In my research on voluntary work, I have had the honor of meeting a group of elderly men, elderly men doing everyday practical uh, uh, tasks for other elderly people. And I interviewed them individually and asked them what had been a special particular moment in their voluntary work. And a man, a widow in his late 70s, shared, shared with me this, that he enjoys making something concrete with his hands fulfilling himself and his interest in woodwork. But the greatest memory for him had been that a few years back, the person organizing these activities had suddenly tapped him on the shoulder and said, you are so important to us. And he was still so touched and so, so moved by this sudden positive feedback that he fell into tears. He was, his deeds were important he was recognized. And why do I use these concepts of individually together? They are concepts rooted in sociology, my main framework of reference. In sociological analysis and in sociological research and also in media often, these late modernity, post-modernity perspectives of individuality and individualization are still far too often, far too emphasized. Global questions actually are more and more re-centered around dilemmas and opportunities that we share. And what I see up and coming are actually new forms of interdependence. Global questions promoting local interests as well as processes of individual self-realization influencing wider, even global interests. And compassion then is a very concrete arena of individually together. Giving to others makes you also to gain, and getting from others makes you want to give. And a sense of meaning arises from the, exper from, from the experience that I'm important to the group of people that I find important. I'm part of my community. And this was exactly the experience of this elderly man whom I was really so happy to interview. And compassion, classically, of course, is about these three steps. It is about noticing, but also feeling the other person's pain. But it's also about readiness to act. Compassion, it demands trust, 
but it also demands respect. We cannot just push our help without respecting the wishes of another person. And we also need to push, uh, or actually not push, but we need to respect our personal limits too. I think that the concept uh, compassion uh, competence by, again, Monica, describes this balance very well. And still, we need to truly recognize the pain of the other person. We cannot just try to find a silver lining and hug the problems away. But let us take another moment in solitude with ourselves. Take a moment and think about a person, perhaps at your workplace, who is emotionally there for you if need be. These wonderful individuals that you are hopefully still thinking about, they are there for you in empathy. They are ready to share your adversity and your pain. But they are also happy to share your, share your joy, your excitement, your positive passions. And in our research team, we are intrigued by this neighboring phenomenon of compassion, namely rejoicing in one's joy rejoicing and sharing one's happiness. Etymology-wise, compassion actually is exactly about a strong feeling, not just negative feeling. So we are interested in this, what we call co-passion. First, noticing the joy and positive passions, excitement of another person, perhaps a colleague, and also feeling it and sharing it emotionally. And third, also expressing this sharing in actions and by actions, perhaps by a high five or a hug, just like in compassion, by offering as a resource your time, your energy, your attention. And further, we are interested in the synergy between compassion and co-passion in the level of experiences, in the level of everyday experiences and emotions, can we ever really separate one from the other? Us sharing sorrows and us sharing joy, just like you and the special person that you were just thinking about. And furthermore, we think that this perspective of individually together also steps in. It illustrates and it underscores the fact and that they are in synergetical or in synergy with each other. It illustrates and underscores this merging of compassion and co-passion and vice versa. Synergy of compassion and co-passion illuminates and further strengthens this individuality, individually together. Authentic me alongside authentic you. And I hope this also would take place at workplaces. So the core of our interest is here. Individually together in compassion and co-passions. It is about the three steps of compassion, understanding, feeling and actions, but also concerning the positive. And such actions, they may be something big and something grand, but very often they are small and spontaneous moments of meaningfulness in the everyday but always they are very and deeply relational between individuals, in a group, between groups. And the spatial element here is a very exciting angle too. In compassion and also in co-passion, there's always the sensing side to it as well. There is, I believe, both the sort of actual sensing side, referring to, for instance, artifacts or the feel of a hug. And we know, for instance, from lab studies that people are able to recognize compassion towards themselves better from touching and by someone indeed touching them than by facial expressions. It is there physically, no words needed. But also there's this mental spatial side, being on the same page, being on the same level with a person where he or she is. Taking the perspective of another person and her or his emotions, even though we might not at all agree with them or empathize with her or his feelings. 
Empathy can be misleading. We know, for instance, from altruism studies that em uh, empathy, of course, always is biased. But how to aim at taking the perspective of someone whom we totally disagree with? Can we share her joy? And can we share her sadness or her pain? And furthermore, individually together in compassion and co-passions also in the societal perspective. I am so intrigued by the fact that there's always this societal and social policy related angle to compassion and co-passions. Elements such as trust or norms, cultural habits, patterns, so uh, patterned social encounters, culture, rituals, stratification of many kinds, religious landscape, societal structures. Societal structures, for instance, have a strong effect on who is, who is perceived as help-deserving sufferer and who not. Societal structures and element, elements include also large institutions and their role, joint cultural experiences, current crisis, or for instance, current media narratives. And I will return to these kinds of elements a bit later. But how to call this? How to call this individually together in compassion and co-passions? In our wonderful team, we have been pondering various candidates, for instance, perspective taking, or actually particularly co-perspective taking, co-connection, co-dare to care, etc. But at the moment, our and my per personal favorite, favorite candidate is this alongsidedness. And with Monica, I have really had the pleasure to share, share such fascinating moments of pondering this concept. And why might it be the best candidate? Well, particularly, I believe, and I believe Monica believes too, <laughs> that it, it really captures this spatial side of compassion and co-passion that I just talked earlier about. Like in Finnish, alongsidedness literally means chest by chest. Furthermore, I love the fact that this alongsidedness has sort of a philosophical tone to it. It is about the depth of humanity. What does it mean to be a human being? That is about alongsidedness. But not only that, it also has this beautifully mundane, everyday tone to it, at least to a non-native speaker. It could be something very little, something very sudden there in the street. And we, of course, also have looked at and contemplated the concept of alongsidedness together with its neighboring concepts, and there are so many of them. And still, we firmly believe that there is something unique to this concept of alongsidedness. For instance, in relation to this fascinating concept of space between, alongsidedness somehow captures, I believe, better this element of being on the same page, on the same site with someone else. But still, this conceptual pondering, pondering is very much work under construction. And thank you for bearing with us, us here. And I hope that this conceptual preliminary analysis, or could it call, be called analysis, sort of still made it clear that we are interested in this individually together and the compassion, co-passion. But Anna, who is really an expert of systematic theological, theological as well as philosophical and language analysis, even though she's also doing empirical work on corporate voluntary work, but she really is an expert on these conceptual issues. So she will step in next and explore these concepts a little further, in a little further depth. But I also want to note at this point that Anna, she really is a multi, multi talented individuals, in the individual. All these beautiful illustrations that unfortunately cannot be seen in the radio, but they are really created, designed, and also executed by Anna. But Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anne-Birgitta, so much for your kind presentation. 
and it's so so nice to be here today to emphasize the happiness and the dynamism in in language in the philosophy of language. I chose Mia's happy face to be be, be the cover photo for 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 my presentation today. Uh, my aim today is is to sketch um, the meta level of building the concept of of alongsidedness. To do this, I will use the uh, the conceptual tools of the philosophy of language, or to be more specific, the tools of the hermeneutical or hermeneutic philosophy of language. You might ask why one would need any more concepts in this world full of words. Well, what put our reflections in motion was actually our qualitative data. In all of our questionnaires, we have included a question. What does the concept of compassion first bring to your mind? The answers we got are rather surprising. They suggest that intuitively people, or at least Finns, don't make a distinction, distinction between responding to suffering and responding to joy in a sympathetic manner. This led us to think that perhaps in the core of human experience, responding to joy and responding to suffering might not be that different. But the challenge is that there seems to be no word to express the positive side of compassion. To put my starting point in the terms of phenomenological philosophy, when reduced, when reduced to its plainest core, there appears to be an experience of being in an intersubjective situation in which one is moved by another's feeling. And this feeling along with another provokes the willingness to act in another's favor. This notion enlarges the more traditional definition of compassion as responding to suffering and thus provokes to develop our reflect reflections a bit further. So my inquiry starts with digging into the possible significations of compassion as a word. I call this stage lexicographic, following the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur. My starting point here is the hermeneutic conception of language. Hermeneutic philosophers such as Ricoeur or Hans-Georg Kadamer Think of language uh, as the essential medium of reaching the richest sphere, sphere of human experience. According to that conception, language is by its nature polysemic. A word, let alone a sentence or a narrative, never has only one significance. Instead, a word posits before us a whole range of possible sig significations, connotations, images. In my opinion, of course, there are several reasons to justify approaching the concept of positive side of compassion through language. Not perhaps exclusively through language, but among the other approaches. The experience that unfolds through language is wider than our own immediate intuition. Finding out the origins of a word helps us to see over and above our own experiential horizon. Looking at signification of a word in its actual setting, living spoken language gives us hints of the many sides of human experience. So, if we look at the etymology of compassion, 
we find a Latin word, compassio. The word compassio in Latin has two components. First, there is this prefix com, which refers to being together or being with. And then there's this passio, that refers to suffering, but also, more generally, the feelings in general, be they either positive or negative. So the original significance of the word compassion, compassion thus has both the meaning of suffering together and feeling together more generally. Feeling together in positive emotions, which we might call compassion, is thus hidden in the polysemy of compassio. Well, probably many of you were already familiar with the, the uh, Latin origin of the word compassion, but I could boldly make an assumption that this is something new. <laughs> uh, the Finnish equivalent of compassion is myötätunto. Myötätunto. <laughs> Not the easiest word to pronounce it. As compa compassion or compassio in Latin, it has, it has two components. <coughs> the prefix myötä means along or with. And then tunto means feeling, emotion. If in Latin word compa compassio, the word passio was of more importance, I think that in Finnish language, the prefix myötä interests me. For a native Finnish speaker, the prefix myötä opens a whole range of significations. Besides myötä, tunto, myötä can be also used with a noun referring to a matter. For example, myötä tuuli, myötä plus wind is tailwind. Then myötä can be connected to a verb. For example, myötä vaikuttaa. Myötä plus to influence means to contribute, to promote something. And then myötä can also be used with other emotions besides compassion. The most common usage in Finland, the nation of shame, <laughs> shamefulness, <laughs> or feeling shameful all the time, would probably be myötä häpeä, myötä plus shame. It means you feel along with someone else the shame someone else who is doing something shameful without even noticing it. <laughs> so there are two things that I want to draw from this inquiry of the polysemy of usages of myötä prefix. First, in Finnish word for compassion, there is a strong element of dynamism. dynamism. The prefix myötä refers to direction, movement, taking something further. That suggests that the experience of compassion is dynamic in its origin. This hints that including the moment of action in the definition of compassion or co-passion is not that far-fetched. Then second, as mentioned, there seems to be no word for the positive side of, of compassion. We have chosen to call this being individually together in compassion and co-passions alongsidedness, as Anne Birgitta pointed out earlier. And the word is, of course, inspired by our mother tongue. Alongsidedness is actually the most accurate translation of myötätunto. Dynamism and living also along with others' joy are the significations we want to include in our definition of alongsidedness. So the next stage is that the more proper philosophical problems emerge. Lexicographical lexico stage sets the sh scheme for a more proper philosophical inquiry. By this I mean elaborating further the aspects that lexicographical inquiry has set before us, developing them further. There are, of course, many possible tracks for philosophical inquiry, and I'll just briefly present one of them. 
Anne Birgitta listed some neighboring concepts of alongsidedness earlier. To that list, I would like to add the concept of recognition. The most recent and most influential theoretician of recognition is German philosopher called Axel Honneth. The concept of recognition aims at encompassing intersubjective relations in different levels. One of the aspects of recognition in Honneth's view is recognition as solidarity. By solidarity, he refers to giving social recognition that in Honneth's view should be present in all communities. The idea behind this is that we all need social esteem that is based on our values as our value as individuals, the value of our individual traits, our individual input to our own community. To expand Honnet's conception of recognition as solidarity, I'd like to add that the moments of co-passions are the moments where solidarity recognition come to flesh in everyday life. Noticing, being moved by and acting upon other person's joy is what solidarity in everyday life is. So, through that, lexicographical and philosophical inquiries paved the way for a more concrete approach, finally. They give us the conceptual apparatus for empirical research, both qualitative and quantitative. But there emerges also an ethical aspect, which of course interests me as an ethics researcher. Developing conceptual tools gives us researchers ethical responsibility. Conceptual tools are our research eyeglasses, so to say. The concepts which we choose to use influence the things we notice. And the things we notice become the things we teach. And that what we teach might become a wider societal norm. So I asked myself a question. What would happen if I if in working life research we didn't take into account alongsidedness. Imagine you would work in, uh, for example, in, in an advertising company. You had just finished a huge project and presented your work to your customer. And the customer had absolutely fallen in love with your work. Then you would go back to your own office, feeling pride, joy, enthusiasm. But nobody would notice that. Nobody would say anything, let alone do something to let others know about your success. I think I at least would feel annihilated. Is my work so worthless in this community that others don't even bother to notice? my joy, and give recognition to my achievement, I would feel worthless. In Axel Honneth's terms, my workplace would lack the recognition in the sense of solidarity. I want to conclude my presentation of the meta level of developing the concept of alongsidedness by pointing out that making sense of the world or making sense, sense of the working life doesn't come to its end at this point. Rather, the empirical dat data again influences our insight on human experience and enrich our perceptions of intersubjective situations. And that's basically the reason why co-passion group is multidisciplinary. And that's why empiricists and theor theoreticians work along, work along with each other. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anna. So fascinating. 
as always. So let us look at this all as sort of a concrete societal cycle. What then happens in different levels of a society? From previous studies, we know that compassion promotes individual creativity and happiness, longevity, life expectancy, well-being, health, etc. All these beautiful and valuable phenomena. But also, compassion promotes individual social networks, reciprocal ties, and mutual trust. And not just for the individuals themselves, but in a wider perspective, in the networks that they are part of. And what then happens is that the societal norms of compassion, sense of solidarity, just like Anna talked about earlier, and the general societal trust are maintained and further strengthened in all levels of a society. And not just that, but also the elements of co-passion, the elements of innovation, shared actions, joy and excitement, and particularly sharing these positive elements, that is reinforced as well. And here we can again see the fusion of compassion and co-passion. For instance, we are more likely to help people and to help someone whom we trust, whom we share positive experiences with. The more compassion, the more co-passion and vice versa in all societal levels. And also society-wide Institutions such as public care system or civil society, which is so strong here in the United States, or religious movements or organizations, they all play a role in this too. White institutions can epitomize phenomena such as compassion and solidarity. They can be advocates and vanguards of care to maintain and to promote values such as compassion and norms of com compassion. Interestingly, for instance, according to European value studies, individuals with the greatest trust in fellow citizens also tend to have the highest level of confidence in public organizations taking care of all of us, such as police or legal system. And the cycle continues. Culture of trust and sharing are further strengthened and so on and so on. The more compassion and co-passion, the stronger this positive cycle. And if they are lacking, the stronger the negative societal cycle. And that is why compassion and all pro-social behavior are so very important to be cherished in practice at all levels of society that we can see here, individual, social and societal. But also, that is why it is so important that we also study them, explore them research-wise on all these levels. And let me illustrate this with one concrete example. I have collected here just a few examples of elements that could be and are barriers to compassion. For instance, if we start here, the noticing element, the first of three steps of compassion. Stress, for instance, individual stress plays a role, but also organizational level, looking at the organizations, for instance, lack of shared activities. But also the societal elements, such as mental, societal and mental social distance between individuals, or shared cultural narratives that could be also negative. Or then looking at the second element of compassion, meaning emotions not only personal emotions and organizational emotional culture and feeling rules, but also shared societal rituals or lack of shared institutions play a role here. And related to the third element, actions. Not only individual history, for instance, or organizational beliefs, but also societal norms. For instance, particular, particular norms in some particular a challenging crisis situation that people would share. And it is very fascinating, I think, to ponder that are there differences in what societal elements hinder compassion? 
for instance, in the United States versus in Northern Europe? Would the elements be the same? But so, compassion and co-passion, individually together, are fundamentally interlinked on all societal levels. And together, they promote sense of meaning. The very question where we started from today and your experiences of meaning. And we know, for instance, that in an, if an individual lives in a society where solidarity is valued and also practiced, she is more likely not only to carry out compassionate acts, but also to find meaning in them. And also, I must add, that on the contrary, if an individual would feel useless, a bit like what Anna was saying and describing so beautifully a little earlier, she's less likely to help others. Sociologist Richard Sennett, for instance, writes about the specter of uselessness, which is a central challenge in today's global capitalism. And if we now contextualize this with today's European societal perspective, it really is a context full of challenges. Sadly so, Europe and Finland too are becoming more and more divided looking at economics, civil society and also our values landscape. And particularly the mental social distances seem to be growing. And that definitely can severely erode societal trust. Traditionally, the trust in fellow human beings has been in Finland on a very high level. And also, Finland exemplifies the fact that higher social security spending has not diminished the individual acts of compassion. Quite the contrary, actually. There really is no European evidence for the notion that public care system and a strong public care system would crowd out social solidarity. And amongst these European societal challenges, there really is a high demand for institutions to join the battle, to fight for the common good and to promote compassion. People have very high expectations towards the public sector in Finland. And we are, Finns are, very happy taxpayers, according to all the studies. But there is also a very very high and rising expectation towards the working places and corporate business. In corporate life, value no longer equals simply economic or functional gain, but it also stands for something deeper, emotional or symbolic or social meanings, as well as shared value. Also, what I can read is that empathy, emotions, and purpose are currently very rising concepts in business literature. There is an evident hunger for humanity. In all work life, not just in business, compassion, of course, is an asset in recruitment, in work commitment, with clients, with customers, with colleagues, and also in leadership and management. People will pay also more for ethical, compassion-related items or artifacts. The work life of the future will value cooperative skills as well as creativity, which are elements not only of compassion but of co-passion. People will, will value those ever, ever higher. And particularly in competitive workplaces, like perhaps the ad agency or, or whatever, co-feeling your colleagues' excitement and positive passions may be much harder much harder than compassion, and yet crucial. For instance, in academic life, if I got a new funding, I'm so happy, and will you rejoice with me? And indeed, just like Anna pinpointed so beautifully earlier, if people's choices are not co-passionately shared, the message is that you are not valuable, and your deeds are not valuable, and that will erode the sense of meaning, again, where we started from. So, to tie this all together, our hypothesis in our co-passion project is that compassion, individually together and combined, combined with co-passion, it is not only contextualized by these societal challenges, 
but it is also an answer to these societal challenges. It will be the car. Oh, actually, my husband pointed out that it will be a truck. <laughs> he it's not a car, it's a truck, he told me. It will be the truck that will take us and our societies forward. And our project, our research project, is built on this hypothesis. And our research question is this. What is compassion, also in the sense of co-passion, in working life? How is it born? How is it strengthened? And how does it affect well-being, among other positive elements? And through that also, wider societal elements, such as productivity. And this synergy really is as crucial as oxygen to individuals, to organizations, and to societies. Another figure illustrated and designed by Anna. <laughs> and this is what we want to explore. And we explore this oxygen of human compassion through three angles. First, within organizations, and we use their compassion interventions and study their effect. Also, outside an organization, and there our case is corporate volunteerism, but also in between organizations and workplaces, namely sharing ideas and innovating together. And today we want to share with you some preliminary findings on interventions. We have conducted emotion skills interventions, character strengths interventions, as well as self-compassion interventions. And emotion skills is what we concentrate on today. And also research-wise, that is the most exciting part because it's very novel, even in global scale. We have also conducted a small citizen survey on these phenomena. Anna actually used some of those open-ended replies earlier, earlier today. And we will also present some of these citizens' viewpoints, some preliminary findings for you today. And in our questionnaires, what is it that we have looked at? Well, we have looked at general and work-related well-being elements, such as work engagement or meaningfulness of work or sense of calling. But also we looked at how compassion elements such as empathy or fear of expressing compassion for others. And team level, we have looked at trust and respectful engagement. And also we have explored elements related to work and family spillover or wisdom even. And you can see the research design of our interventions here. That means we have participant groups, we have control groups for the participant groups. And we have collected questionnaire material before and after the interventions, as well as six months after the interventions. And we are planning to interview people nine months after the interventions. We have included the perspective of leaders, but also the perspective of subordinates. And where has this all taken place? Not only in corporate business, but in various organizations. Nordea is a large Nordic institution of its own, a banking group. Local Tapiola being an insurance company, a nationwide in Finland. City of Espo, as well as National Gallery that includes a few art museums. And then MTV Kolme News, which is actually a nationwide uh, newsroom of an, a nationwide popular TV channel. And what are these emotion skills about? They are all together about an in-depth 18 hour period, a training period that lasts from, from six to eight weeks. And the modules you can see here. First, there's a module related to increasing emo emotional awareness and also understanding the elements and factors behind emotions. Also, the modules focus both on positive as well as negative emotions. And the fifth module is titled Toolkit, Concrete Toolkit for Leading Emotions. And the last one is about systematically leading the emotional climate at workplaces. And these modules have been developed together with Jarkko Rantanen, who is a consultant that has been working together with corporate business and organizations for years. 
So it is a model not designed by us out of the blue, but it has been modified over the years and together with organizations. And in our team, Mia has conducted every single one of these emotions interventions and the feedback, feedback has been enormously positive and people have been so excited. And after a little while, Mia will present these six modules and the feedback that we have got a little more in detail. And that really is something exciting to hear. And also the feedback that we have got from the character strength interventions conducted in our team by Lotta and Kaisa. Actually, Kaisa's face was the very first slide, uh, her beautiful smiling face there. So they have conducted this character strength intervention. And also there, the feedback has been so positive. Kind of like this is what the world needs, if I would need to summarize it. And what I think is very important here is that when you look at these modules, they are not modules of compassion, but they are modules of individually together. They are modules of compassion and co-passion. And before we hear a little more about these interventions, I just want to conclude a few notions of our sort of structure and our project. So what is there anything sort of special about our project? Not perhaps anything so extremely unique, but there are certain elements. We focus on the everyday level. We focus on various perspectives. We want to include different kinds of data and also to be able to illustrate some sing singular in-depth compassion episodes and their unfolding in our narratives, uh, narrative interviews. And also, really, this positive side and the negative side being in synergy, as well as the social, organizational and individual level analysis. And as I noted, Mia really has conducted these emotion skills interventions as part of her doctoral research. Mia's background is in business and administration studies, but she really is a multi-talented person of various fascinating themes. And she will step in next. But I also want to introduce Frank Martella, standing there <laughs> to you. He's a postdoc researcher, a real Renaissance man. He's, a, he's an expert of various fascinating themes. And after Mia, he will be presenting our preliminary findings based on these intervention studies. But also Frank will be presenting uh, the constellation of our citizen survey and some teach bits also of those findings. But Mia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna Birgitta and Anna. I feel such a warm energy coming here. <laughs> um, so now that we've done all the interventions, the emotional skills interventions, we want to share some of the first-hand experience that we've gotten. Um, well, first I have to say that we are in Finland, and that's where we might sit with you in a car, share a two-hour ride in silence, not feeling awkward. <laughs> <laughs> or when it's pouring and the shelter is taken. <laughs> <laughs> and it might seem that Finns, we are in special need for emotional or um, relational skills, but um, most likely it's a universal need. We often lack like sophisticated vocabulary even for emotions, and let alone skills to communicate and recognize and regulate emotions. So that's what we're focusing on, these emotional skills, skills interventions. Um, and what we found, what in, as first-hand experience, what the corporations, what the employees really need and want is that is an antidote to exactly these things that Anna Birgitta said. All the hurry and time pressures, stress, hierarchy, um, fear, isolation even, we need to feel, um, we need to feel connection uh, with each other and uh, 
uh, we're in desperate need to having skills of taking care of our well-being uh, and uh, our resources and constructive ways to say no, even. And what we found out that uh, is especially valued is to be able to share these things. We often do not talk about emotions. We do not talk about compassion, let alone prioritize them. <coughs> so this has been one of the most valuable things. Simply being able to gather around, gather together with the team of leaders or the work community and share these things together. It might be scary, but this has been very, very valuable. And one of the tools that has helped in this uh, sharing is something that we call seven set. When we talk about the seven needs that we all people share and need to feel and experience interest, and the seven are interest, appreciation, understanding, fairness, autonomy, progress, and meaning. And having shared this um, experience that okay, we really um, we can strengthen these experiences and strengthen positive emotions in our connections and relationships. And also, this is a great checklist to uh, see that whenever someone is misbehaving or feeling bad, or we can go uh, and see whether and think through that whether this person is feeling that she's not having control or she is not appreciated, or she is uh, not treated fairly, for example. And one of the, then when we look at one of the, like the worries or misunderstandings or questions or that come up with, that come up are, for example, um, that when we talk about leading emotions, we often are afraid that, okay, that means that we need to talk about emotions all the time at work. And that might be very scary, um, but that's not what it means. Um, but what we do need to understand is that we are in a, in a business of well-being. We are in the business of letting and enabling people to grow and, and to give, find and experience uh, meaning. And for example, this is one, one example that uh, you don't need to be an extrovert, you can be introvert, you can be shy and still have an authentic way to strengthen someone's experience of interest or appreciation. So there's no one way. But um, instead of shutting down compassion or emotions, we should give room for it and actually face uh, the difficult situations if possible. And for example, going through an organizational change or having, for, having to, for example, lay off employees is definitely a situation that would um, bring about fear and fear-related thoughts. And it might be scary, understandably, to go ahead and face these situations. And we have hands full of work, so we will, might want to just go on with our work and just forget that thing, and that will fix by itself. But we've had uh, these situations in our interventions as well. And what we've done is that when people, as scary as it might have been at first, once we've sat down and shared all these thoughts and, um, and emotions even, uh, it's been deliberating and, and empowering and encouraging, and people have felt the shared understanding and have it, and they've gotten concrete tools to go ahead and share these discussions with their subordinates and, and their colleagues as well. Or another example, when in a customer encounter, um, a guy comes in to get a loan from a bank and he's seemingly nervous. And this customer servant, uh, represent, service representative can go on and tell all these fine features of the product trying to just go ahead and, and you see, this is a very good product, don't be nervous. Or she could simply ask that, are you perhaps a little bit nervous? And being heard and seen in this experience um, might relieve the nervousness and even bring room in our brain for some reason. After which we are more effective to take in all the fine, product features as well, 
and understand them and listen to them. Um, and then Sanna Birgitta talked about it being individually together or not recognized in solidarity. That's well, very well put, I think, in this, some of the feedback that people share. Um, in one of the work communities or teams, one manager said like this, we are given tools in order to become a team, a great team. And then spontaneously another person on the other side of the table said, no, the best team. And then yet again, a third one said, no, a top team. And I feel that this is quite luxurious that we are given this time. Even now there's work messages coming in all the time, but I have not touched them. Each one of us has lots of work, but the fact that we are here all the 18 hours and that we have been authorized to this training, I believe will benefit in the long run too. That we were given this time to focus on this, to come together and genuinely we, genuinely we have become a team. This is a great encouragement, also a great investment from our top management, a gift. I've never received anything like this before in my work career. And for example, this team, I've learned now after a year that they still meeting with each other and sharing all, like, what, what have you been trying out now? And sharing this experience. So we need the encouragement from other people as well, as well as organizational structures. Um, and also the, the kind of mindset that we're gonna uh, that we are developing in the trainings, our sharing, uh, definitely combine compassion and co-passion. Um, so we want to be alongside all the emotions and experiences, to be heard and seen, and to nurture connection, to be able to tell our stories courageously. And when people describe the feeling when someone is compassionately present for them. At work, they say, for example, that it feels like one is important. The other person genuinely cares. But one feels safe or makes you want to spread the goods. Such a good feeling that one could do anything, could run a marathon. <laughs> or one is elevated to another level. Or we are at our purest. So we simply should not have to choose at work, like work or being a whole human being. Mm. I'm afraid, come on, tell us something. <laughs> 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 Hi, everybody. I'm Frank. And I used to think of myself more of a philosopher, but in this project I've become like more this Mr. Data who comes in and tells about these quantitative results. So that's what I gotta do. So I, so I first I'm gonna like tell Hi, we would love to see your face, but you're covered in words. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Awesome. Thanks. So like first I'm gonna like present some data from this like these interventions that Mia, Mia was like describing and Mia has been doing. And a couple, we have like, measuring like quite many things like during before and after the interview, and we don't have like this like six months later data yet. But like some some data, some like results from that list, like what, what has like changed from before the intervention to after the intervention. And one thing we measured was this emotional mastery, which was like measured by questions like, I understand what emotions are. I have the means and ability to awaken positive emotions at my workplace. And as you can see, then like the intervention group was like experiencing some, some increase in their sense of emotional mastery with this intervention. And other things that we have measured was like this sense of affective wisdom, which was measured with this affective wisdom scale from this three dimensional wisdom scale. And again, here we saw that like there was like some improvement along the intervention group. And, and the third result was like the we also measured this like the sense of compassionate motivation. It's like so that's not, not only about like do I feel that I have like these emotions, but also like this like do do I have this motivation to help other people? So it was measured with like items like I would rather engage in actions that help others than engage in actions that would help me. And again we saw that like these people who took, took this intervention, this like me which me I was taking, they experienced afterwards more 
more of this sense of compassionate motivation. Another in interesting result was also that they experience less this fear of expressing compassion. Because sometimes we want to be compassionate, but like one reason that we are not is that we are like, kind of like fear we fear that you know that it's like it's not a good thing to express my, myself as a compassionate person because you know other might be, other people might take advantage of me if they think that I'm a compassionate person. And this was also like in, there was also a like clear decrease in this sense of fear of expressing compassion among these people who were part of this intervention. So this was like kind of like more this like this more precise precise about this intervention was like kind of like aiming at like lessen the fear of expressing compassion, increasing their compassionate motivation and their like affective and emotional mastery. But we noticed also that people who took this intervention, they also experienced more positive affect afterwards. And interesting was like when I look at this, like what drives this effect, I found that like actually that this, this effect was mediated by the sense of emotional mastery. And it was like fully mediated by that. So that means that like people, when they took this intervention afterwards, they after afterwards, they felt more that they had like this more of this emotional mastery, and that was what was driving them to have also a more positive effect. And the similar similar effect was also visible as regard negative effect. That people who took this intervention they experienced less negative effect afterwards, and again it was like fully mediated by the sense of emotional mastery. So that was like something that the, this intervention was like increasing their sense of emotional mastery. And when they had the more of this emotional mastery, they also felt that they, got like, they have like more positive emotions and less, less negative emotions at work. But in addition to like measuring things by, by the self-rating, we also had like the subordinates of these people taking, taking this intervention to rate their, rate, their, rate their leaders. And we found that like people who took this like intervention, the subordinates rated that their servant leadership was like increasing through this intervention. There's like some interesting, interesting stuff here was that actually there's like quite a big difference between the intervention group and control group before the intervention. But still we found this effect that it seems that like that the intervention group was like increasing in their sense of servant leadership. And servant leadership is measured by items like my manager helps me to develop myself. My management is not chasing recognition and my management, management, manager shows her true feelings. So like this, it seems that like these people's sense of that the, the subordinates felt that their managers were more of these like servant leaders after this intervention, and the same re result was true also as regard this autonomy support. Autonomy support was measured by items like the man my manager gives me choices and options, the my manager listens to how I would like to do things and so forth. So people after they after they take this intervention they seem to be given like more this have like this more supportive attitude towards their subordinates and the subordinates accordingly felt that you know that they have like more they are they have their, their autonomy is more supported in this work environment and finally there was also like this sense of respectful engagement was also like increased through through the intervention and this respectful engagement means that like it was measured by questions like organization members pay attention to each other's needs and organizational members make requests requests to each other, not demands. And again we saw that like this intervention, like intervention that was done to these like managers was increasing like the organizational members' sense of respectful engagement from each other. So this these were like quite interesting findings that we got from this intervention and we're gonna like Developed in, we, we're gonna have, when, when they got when, get these the results from the six months afterwards, we're gonna have like more knowledge about like how lasting these changes are. But then I will quick, quickly show like a couple of other results that we got from this. Like we, we had this like survey for the general population, but which was like kind of just this internet internet sample, and 433 people answered this survey, and then we like ran some analysis with this structural equation modeling to see what can like what kind of things are driving these effects? Because we want to see like the things that we are like increasing in these interventions, what are these things causing more generally? And one model that we came up with was like this, that the person like most, in, like this, this is like this cross-sectional data. So we cannot be like sure about the causality, but let's still like these models, this is the way the model fits best with the data. So we can like say like some cautious things about like how the causality might be running and we see that like when people have this feeling feeling that the emotions have like this power that they realize that the 
emotions have like in, in, important in, influences within the organization. After after they have the sense of this feeling, they also have like more empathy and more. They also feel that they have like more the sense of social impact. And one of the interesting findings was that this sense of social pro social impact that when people felt that their work is doing something good to other people, that has like very strong effect on this organizational commitment. That when people felt that that is like their work is doing something good, they were much more committed to the organization that they were in. And another effect, effect was that this when people had this fear of expressing compassion, when this fear of ex expressing compassion when, when it was lower, people had also had like more empathy and more compassionate motivation. And then this empathy again, again like had a positive effect on their self-rated health. Another model that we looked at was like, what does this respectful engagement, what is it connected to? And we found first that like there's a very strong connection between respectful engagement and, organ and organizational commitment, like a direct connection between these two, which seems to show that like people who feel that they're like respected by their, like their peers and other colleagues, they are much more committed to the organization that they are in. But this respectful engagement also had like an effect on work engagement and an effect on negative affect. That when people were felt that they had that they were respected, they had like they experienced less negative affect, and this again was like co connected to self-rated health. So that the people when they experienced less negative affect, their self-rated health was better. And additionally, like, respectful engagement increased the sense of work engagement, and this work engagement also had this effect on this organizational commitment. And the final model I'm going to show, show is about this sense of pro-social impact. And we found that two things that we were like, which were like a kind of predicting sense of pro-social impact were like the sense of empathy and when the organization had, the, when the organization had this norm against compassion, when people felt that, you know, in, in my organization, it's not allowed to be compassionate or show your emotions. This was like something that like lessened their sense of pro-social impact. And when there was like pro-social impact, it has like a, had like a direct effect on this work engagement. So people who, who, who felt that their, their work is doing something good, they were also like more engaged. But even more, they felt that their work was like much more meaningful when they had this like sense of pro-social impact. And when, they, when the work was like meaningful, that had like also like a long, strong effect on work, engage, work engagement. So like by increasing your sense of pro-social impact in the work, you can like increase also the sense of meaningfulness that people experience at work and also the sense of like work engagement that they have. So that concludes my part of the, the data thing. And now back. Thank you, Frank. Isn't it just so exciting? And I just want to conclude with a few tidbits of this qualitative open-ended answers that, that our citizens and our, our interview participants shared with us. What does the concept of compassion first bring to your mind? Here we can see elements of compassion and co-passion getting mixed and mingled with each other again. For instance, compassion is about caring or love or mercifulness or engaging encounters. And Anna and Mia so beautifully described, described examples of these. And also we asked what could be the practical ways of, of promoting compassion at workplaces? We asked this in the questionnaire as well as in, we discussed it in the interventions. And let's just conclude with this. First of all, we can promote compassion at workplaces via elements related to the giver perspective. Time management is important. For instance, being merciful to oneself and to the others. And the power of light being in your hands. Promoting it wouldn't need miracles, one person noted in the questionnaire. Or the fact that no merit prevents you from giving a friendly smile or a high five. And also the manager's role was definitely underscored a lot. Actions, not empty words, was demanded. And what was rather intriguing and slightly perhaps sad in our data is that the receiver perspective seems to be rather tri uh, tricky. And I believe that this receptive side of compassion, particularly in competitive workplaces, but not only that, also in dynamic, driven-oriented workplaces, this could be hard. Do we really feel and hear the words and deeds of compassion when they are directed at, uh, at us? And then, as a standby workplaces, do we notice moments of compassion? 
and do we encourage it? For instance, raising awareness was one quotation, or by praising, by thanking. And do we tell others about what we see? Do we spread the word? And then the fourth element concerning self-compassion. Our data talks a lot about being gentle with, with oneself. You have always something to give to other person, like one interviewer put it. Shared humanity. We are all just humans, both unique and not unique, somebody wrote in the questionnaire. And then just the conscious present, presence, remembering to breathe. That was something that was explicated in our, in our material. And the fact, of course, is that compassion is very and deeply contagious in many rounds and in many levels. And the voices from our data, the voices from the grassroots level that we have heard of, they underscore the fact that we do not need big gestures and speeches of love and care. Compassion and co-passion are about, particularly about, situation-specific spontaneous acts and very contagious. The universal language of compassion and love will spread. Thank you so much for listening compassionately, and I hope also co-passionately. Thank you. We have time for probably one or two questions. Does someone have a burning question you'd like to ask? Yes. Is, is there a difference in these seminars or these that you give um, training courses that you have on compassion? Is there a difference in big organizations versus smaller ones in the effectiveness of them? Is there a difference in big organizations okay. versus small Big or small organizations in the industry? In the industry. Yeah. Um, when we when we're in Finland, uh, they're big, they're large. Uh, the the two financial services um, organizations are one of the two like they're the two biggest, and um, the the second biggest municipality and the art national art gallery is the the, the biggest, and uh, yeah. So we really haven't conducted the interventions in small organizations, but definitely we keep on getting calls and emails every week. So there seems to be an urge and need also definitely in, in smaller scale context. And we hope to take it further there together with Monica's Institute. Another question? Uh, there is a few hands. Uh, should we take? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, presentations. Uh, okay, can I ask, what, what you've shown is that there are very positive aspects on the way that people uh, behave and think about compassion and empathy. What people managers might also be interested in is were there any effects on what happened in the workplace on performance measures or outputs or outcomes with clients, customers and so exactly. on. And I wonder if you were looking at that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it is included our, in our um, research question and the focus, and also our funding agency, of course, is very intrigued by that element. <laughs> and uh, as we still only have the preliminary findings, so we haven't really gone there yet, but we are about to do also and, and look at also those um, sort of internal indications, uh, indicators from each of these houses. So to be able to see perhaps that what has happened there in each of these contexts sort of uh, numbers wise after the interventions. So definitely that will be something that we will be uh, looking at. And not only the mo uh, numbers and then the, and the money matter, but we, we hope to be looking at some, some of these elements of, let's say, well-being at work or togetherness at work. So, and uh, if I may say it here, we will be returning, hopefully, if, if, if Monica says yes, so we'll be returning here in, in early 2017 to present our final findings, so it is something to, to be continued, and I, I personally hope to see you again then. Can I take one more hand? Thank you. The interventions were so successful. I was wondering, just briefly, the nature of the interventions, like what was 
how, how that was approached, how that was carried out. Yeah. Um, the um, I will try to answer. The, do you mean by, for example, um, there's a lot of literature and discussions, cases, um, homework, and we need six times for three hours mm -hmm. during six or eight weeks. So it's quite intensive. And I gave the one example of one concrete tools, but we will get some 40. Mm -hmm. So that's why they probably are too eager to um, continue meeting with each other. So they have a lot to talk about. Yeah. Definitely. A long hunger list. for. <laughs> hunger for more. Was that something that you meant? Yeah, because it's sort of like your findings would be very uh, helpful in promoting your, your program. Mm. Exactly. And to get people on board to understand yeah. it, but without necessarily having had the findings yet, mm -hmm. how do you start the, the ball rolling? How do you get people involved and committed mm -hmm. to be yeah. compassionate, co compassionate? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and that's an important angle, and we hope to not only to uh, write these academic papers and, and perhaps books, but also something practical, some kind of not only papers, but even something shorter, perhaps an app uh, or, or, or something that could be really used in the grassroots level. Our, our passion as a group of researchers is to change the world a little, so it's sort of positive anarchy that we have here. <laughs> So I didn't mention in the introduction, but I'll mention by way of conclusion that the um, this great team of people. Um, invited some of us to come to Helsinki in January thinking they were going to have a seminar <coughs> and I showed up thinking a wonderful conversation with 20 colleagues and 700 people showed up <laughs> so there's such a deep interest in this topic and um, compassion and work and I'm so thrilled that the circle of compassion and work researchers is expanding so please um, help me thank them for coming all the way to California. <laughs>